Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. This month, we focus on November's research, industry news, and ways that you can help hasten the defeat of aging. Starting off with our research roundup. A study published in the Annals of Translational Medicine has shown the effects of niacin supplementation on a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. The researchers employed six wild-type mice, six Alzheimer's-prone mice given niacin, and six transgenic Alzheimer's-prone mice in the control group. All of these mice were eight months old. After six months of feeding, the mice were tested with the Morris Water Maze Test, which tests the ability of mice to find and stand on a platform in water. While all the Alzheimer's-prone mice performed similarly on the first day, the ones given niacin learned more quickly, having light sea times more akin to those of wild-type mice. The researchers suggest that energy metabolism, along with a reduction in inflammation and a reduction in amyloid beta, are the means by which niacin affects the progression of Alzheimer's. While specific genes were identified, whether this research can translate to humans is unclear. However, if niacin or another approach focused on NAD can affect the progression of Alzheimer's disease, it will be a welcome gift to those in desperate need of disease-modifying treatments. A recently published paper has caused some waves in the longevity community by showing that NAD precursor nicotinamide riboside, also known as NR, makes tumors more aggressive in a mouse model. NAD has a complex relationship with cancer. On one hand, cancer cells are highly metabolically active and require a lot of energy to grow and divide. Many types of cancer cells have been shown to depend on metabolic pathways regulated by NAD. On the other hand, Activated immune cells that fight cancer also consume more NAD, and there is evidence that NAD supplementation fights cancer by boosting the immune system. In this experiment, the researchers divided several mice into two groups, putting one on a regular diet and the other one on an NR-rich diet. Two weeks later, both groups were inoculated with cancer cells. By week 10 of the experiment, 7 out of 10 mice in the NR group and 5 out of 9 mice in the control group had detectable tumors a 27% difference. However, with such a small sample size, this was not statistically significant data, and even a single mouse could have changed the results. In the next experiment, researchers assessed the effect of NR supplementation on the rate of tumor formation by injecting cancer cells directly into the heart. 9 out of 11 mice in the study group and only 3 out of 12 in the control group developed tumors. This result easily clears the bar of statistical significance. Interestingly, the researchers also demonstrated the anti-cancer side of NR by showing that its uptake is sharply increased in T-cells upon activation. This suggests that both cancer cells and cancer-fighting cells need NAD to fuel their increased energy demands, and scientists might have to figure out a way to strike a good balance here. Growing evidence suggests that NAD supplementation has many health benefits, but this study shows that its universal ability to spur cellular activity needs to be carefully studied and considered when devising treatments. It is possible that prior to cancer emergence, NAD supplementation fuels the immune system in ways that help prevent cancer, but after the disease is there, it fuels the cancer cells as well. Of course, more research is needed to either support or disprove this hypothesis. Researchers publishing in Nutrients have shown that adding a strain of lactic acid bacteria to the gut flora of older memory-impaired people partially alleviates their memory problems. The researchers begin their paper by noting that mild cognitive impairment, known as MCI, is associated with memory loss and is a frequent precursor of Alzheimer's disease. While no treatment has been shown to reverse Alzheimer's disease, there have been longitudinal studies showing that the reversal of MCI is possible and that lifestyle factors are important in the development of Alzheimer's. Therefore, while entirely curing Alzheimer's is not yet possible, it might be possible to prevent it. Previous research has shown a relationship between the gut flora and the development of Alzheimer's disease. Other research has shown a role of inflammatory cytokines. This led the researchers towards a novel approach, altering the gut flora through the addition of a strain of lactic acid bacteria that promotes an anti-inflammatory cytokine shown to protect neurons in Alzheimer's disease. The results were interesting, and being in the treatment group, 
rather than the control group, was found to be a significant factor in the retention of cognitive abilities, specifically visual memory. Treatment group participants had, on average, slightly higher visual memory scores than when they started, while the placebo group slightly declined. Regression analysis was performed to identify potentially confounding factors. Dietary cholesterol was negatively associated with cognitive function and seemed to impede the effects of the lactic acid bacteria, while vitamin K seemed to aid in the treatment. While this study shows a strong relationship between the lactic acid bacteria administration and a reduction in cognitive decline, the researchers note a few limitations. This analysis was performed on a group of generally healthy Japanese adults living in the same community. There was no direct analysis of brain biomarkers performed, and there was also no biochemical analysis of the mechanism of action. The researchers intend to follow up this study with further investigation into this area. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website. In the world of longevity media, November saw some new videos from Ryan O'Shea of Lifespan News. Here, he explores whether or not drinking coffee can help you live longer. Numerous studies have pointed to the health benefits of coffee, but there are still lingering questions about just how much you should be drinking and the type of coffee you should be using. Now, a new human study is giving us some answers. Drawing on data from UK Biobank, scientists have once again confirmed the association between coffee and better health outcomes, with ground coffee emerging as the healthiest type. Coffee was once considered rather unhealthy. One study from 1988 found that 80% of physicians recommended avoiding coffee to their patients with cardiovascular problems, which may be because coffee may transiently elevate blood pressure. However, in recent decades, evidence to the contrary has been steadily accumulating. Now, the European Society of Cardiology considers drinking three to four cups of coffee a day to be moderately beneficial, and the American Heart Association notes that the evidence for coffee's health benefits stacks up quickly. Coffee is also associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes and Parkinson's disease. While caffeine is by far the most well-known ingredient in coffee, coffee contains more than 100 biologically active chemicals, including polyphenols, which are potent antioxidants. Like many recent studies, this new study published in the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology makes use of UK Biobank, a huge open repository of various health data on around half a million British citizens. The size of UK Biobank enables researchers to control for many variables. In this case, covariates included age, gender, ethnicity, BMI, comorbidities such as hypertension and type 2 diabetes, and lifestyle risk factors of smoking, tea consumption, and alcohol consumption. Participants with a cardiovascular diagnosis at baseline were excluded, and the median age was 58 years. Importantly, the study considered three popular types of coffee, ground, instant, and decaf. Participants were only able to select one type of coffee, and then were grouped into six intake categories, ranging from zero cups to more than five cups. In line with most existing studies, coffee consumption was shown to be generally beneficial. Coffee intake of up to five cups per day was associated with significant reductions in the risks of cardiovascular disease, congestive cardiac failure, coronary heart disease, stroke, and various arrhythmias. The biggest risk reduction was detected in the two to three cups per day group. Ground coffee consistently outperformed the other two types, including with arrhythmias, cardiovascular mortality, and all-cause mortality. The ideal dose of ground coffee appears to be two to three cups per day. People who drank this amount were a full 27% less likely to die from all causes than non-drinkers during the follow-up period. Despite the inherent limitations of this study, the results are compelling and in line with previous research. It appears that moderate coffee consumption may confer some protection against cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. So, will this study change how you view coffee or how much you drink? Let us know in the comments. When there's more to share, we'll have it for you here. So please subscribe so you don't miss out. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and we'll see you next time on Lifespan News. Other new episodes include one on the impact of olive oil on longevity, one on a possible NMN banned by the FDA, and one on the link between exercise and cancer. Visit the Lifespan News YouTube channel to find these and more. Meanwhile, Life Noggin has released two new videos from their collaboration with the Sense Research Foundation. These videos explain how Sense scientists are working to combat the damage associated with aging through various programs. The first video explored Lysosense and why cemeteries don't glow 
and the second introduces might of sense and reminds us all about the powerhouse of the cell. Here's a taste of that. Thank you so much to the SENS Research Foundation for sponsoring this video. I asked Triangle Bob to design what he thinks humans will look like in the year 2200. He's been at it for like five hours now, so I'm just gonna see what he's done. For the love of animator, what the heck is that? Uh, I, I mean, wow, Triangle Bob, they look great. I see it says here that you've also added super mitochondria to make them live longer. Okay, we'll have to explore this further. Cue the intro. Hey there, welcome to Life Noggin. Turns out Triangle Bob was onto something with his mitochondrial improvement DLC. A super small tweak can have a really huge impact on human evolution. Yeah, it's a pretty big deal. But to explain it further, we need to travel inside the body. Let's visit your body's power plant, shall we? Seatbelts, everyone. I've always wanted to say that. Oh wow, here it is, the city of Mitotropolis. If there's anything you humans remember from biology class, it's that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. But what does that really mean? After you digest your food, the byproducts make their way into your cells, and eventually into the mitochondria. Here, they are broken down and made into a chemical called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. This is what your cells use to store and transport the energy they need to function. Uh-oh, this isn't good. That process created waste products called free radicals. These guys can damage important parts of your cells, like mitochondrial DNA. I mean, look at the mess they're making. Normally when we talk about DNA, we mean the DNA in your chromosomes, which are located in the cell's nucleus. But mitochondrial are really unique in that they have a small amount of their own DNA. And I mean a really small amount. There used to be a whole lot more actually, but as humans evolved, the majority of them moved inside the nucleus, where it's a lot safer. Scientists believe that the remaining ones are the most essential to the energy production process. For instance, 13 of these genes create the chemicals needed to make the wonderful ATP. We have to protect those guys. So here's the issue happening inside you, the beautiful flesh monster watching this video. When mitochondria Mitochondrial DNA is damaged by free radicals. It can delete portions of the genetic code, making it impossible to create these chemicals and make energy. But the mutant mitochondria do keep making free radicals, which can cause oxidative stress, leading to diseases like cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, as well as aging. Humans dislike that. Now, how do we even fix this? While we can't prevent mitochondrial DNA from getting damaged, scientists are finding ways to keep the mitochondria working properly by taking evolution into their own hands. Like the mitochondrial genes that already migrated to the nucleus on their own, scientists are creating backup copies of the 13 essential genes in the mitochondrial DNA. They're putting them in the nucleus as well, where they're protected. Don't worry, these backups will keep things running smoothly for longer. One group of researchers has already begun Begun working on this and created backup copies of two of the 13 genes which they're testing in mice. If this works out, we could be seeing dramatic drops in cancer rates, age-related diseases, and yeah, it'll slow down the aging process. Humans like that. To learn more about this cool tech, go check out our sponsor over at the SENS Research Foundation. They're doing amazing work in this field and they definitely should get your support. Make sure to visit the Life Noggin YouTube channel to subscribe and keep up to date with new releases, and help us in our quest for longer and healthier human lives. And on that note, our end of the year fundraiser is happening now. Our team is accelerating progress in the longevity field, clarifying misconceptions about aging research and spreading awareness about the possibilities of rejuvenation biotechnology. Our Advocacy Foundation has big projects lined up for 2023, but we need your help to turn plans into action. Please donate on our website to be a part of helping us accomplish our goals. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup Podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. <laughs> <laughs>